me in welcoming the writer and director of I Think I Do, Brian Schmeller. exciting to get to show the movie again on a big screen and I'm really thankful for the festival for really uh, you know doing this and really helping us get the film back out into the world it hasn't been around for a few years and uh, it's really great to kind of see it coming back to life in a way <laughs> and that's very um, very exciting for me um, I was talking outside like on the, with the social media about sort of where the idea for this movie started and it started really like 1994, and the idea was really about trying to, trying to put a movie on screen that was sort of positive. <laughs> 1994 was like kind of a dark time a little bit, like it kind of reminds me of now in some ways, but uh, you know, people, the AIDS crisis was still, you know, happening at that time, and there was just a lot of, there was not a lot of equality for gay people anywhere. Um, and the idea about this movie was trying to make something that was funny, something that was going to be romantic, and something where nobody dies. Um, and that's really true. Like, I say that as a joke, but that was really one of the things, because a lot of movies at that time, that's what was happening. So hopefully we succeeded. I think people will laugh at the 90s a little bit, and laugh at the romance a lot, and also this group of friends, too. Because like uh, Nick was saying, this is really, an ensemble about this group of friends who kind of come back together and uh, and have a fun time and get into all sorts of wacky mishaps. So um, thanks for coming. Enjoy the show, and we'll be here after to uh, do karaoke and take your questions. Thanks. Hey, I'm Mike Doyle. I'm a proud alum of the U-Fest. My film, Sell By, now known as Almost Love, Open the 31st. Uh, I'm so happy to moderate this Q&A. I saw this film at the Quad back in the day in the movie theater, and it's, it was such a delight to revisit it this week. I just want to say before I bring them up, uh, at the time, <laughs> the New York Times said, this is an impressive feature film directing debut. The characters live in a world in which heterosexual women don't faint when they learn the man they're attracted to is gay. They're just disappointed for their own selfish reasons. <laughs> uh, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring up writer-director Brian Sloan and cast member Jamie Harrell. So uh, I, I guess my first question is the obvious one. Um, what is it like to revisit this film after all these years in a crowded theater on the big screen? Uh, well, yeah, I really have not seen it on the screen since it was first out, and it was great seeing uh, Tuck get exit applause. Yeah, like, I, don't like that. <laughs> I don't know, his performance has aged over 25 years and is even better now, I guess. Uh, yeah, it was really funny to see and hear people's reactions. And we were just talking about different performances land differently when you see it, because it is an ensemble and you see different things every time. And I was watching it this time, and I was like, Marianne is so committed to her sereness. In this movie. <laughs> it's like laser focus. And it's so not her personality, by the way. Um, but she's just so funny. I was cracking up watching her because I was just like, wow, she's really, she's, she's in for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to talk about the ensemble because you create such a rich tapestry of friendships that is not easy to pull off. Um, and your job as a director is to sort of hire the right ingredients and see how they mix. Can you talk about um, building that ensemble and the chemistry that you that you developed? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was definitely a big part of this film, and we spent like a lot of time casting the movie, much longer than you usually spend on an independent film because you don't have any money. But um, we had you know trouble finding cast, especially for the male roles. Uh, we couldn't get actors to. Sh come in because a lot of agents and managers at that time were kind of not willing to put their clients up for these types of roles. I do have to shout out Richie Jackson who's here tonight. He's here tonight, yes. Uh, who was Alexis's agent and was a huge Woo! supporter of our project. Thank you, Richie. Because the work, you know, advocates out 
out there, but I would say it was really hard getting people to um, read the script and, and even come in. So it took a long while for us to get this group together. I feel like it was almost five months, something like that. And, um, and we just saw lots and lots of actors. I feel like we just saw every actor under 30 in New York. <laughs> and, and people we saw, like a lot of people, Kelly Ripa came in for one of the parts. Um, you know, there was just like everyone from Fantastic Rent came in. You know, it was kind of like everybody was coming in for this movie. And it was, you know, it was so much about pairing everybody up and seeing like how everybody kind of fit in the puzzle. Did Margaret show, was it she attached for a little while? Yeah, Margaret was going to play the bride for a little bit. And then we didn't have any money to make the movie. <laughs> so we had to push our schedule back. And, uh, yeah, so we were people were kind of coming in and out, and I know you came in to audition for us actually. Yeah, when you were in Juilliard, and you know I realized you fell out probably because we were supposed to shoot in the summer, yeah, and then we got pushed to October. So, oh, yeah, thank you. That's why I'm here. That's why you're here. <laughs> uh, but I have, a, I have a question for you, Jamie, um, because you know what's so great about this film is that it is of its time and it's so wonderfully ahead of its time in that we're not, we're exploring stories and we're, we're taking for given we're, uh, many things that uh, simply weren't a given at the time. Yeah. And so Jamie, I was wondering if, if you had any thoughts at the time as a young actor about going in for a film like this. Oh, I wanted to be in it. Yeah. I, I think Paul Rudd was up for this part, and I was like, I'll be at their 25th anniversary. <laughs> 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 um, wait, what was the question? <laughs> so, so your thoughts about uh, being in an indie gay rom-com? In oh my gosh, I like this. Our pet was already attached. I, he blew me away in Jack B. Nimble. Did you all see that movie? In the movie or um, um, Last Exit to Brooklyn. I was a huge fan of his. Uh, Guillermo was in Party Girl. Um, Warren and Lane Yanger was a producer of I Like It Like That. I was a huge, like I, I was one of those people that would see every indie movie by myself. So, yeah, and um, another thing that's ahead of its time is that you have all these queer actors in the film playing all different sorts of parts, and that was very forward thinking at the time. Yeah, I mean, I really, when people were coming in, you know, I. I just kind of thought like who really fits these parts the best and it, you know if they if they were gay if they were straight it didn't really matter to me because it was really about pairing people up and you know like you know pairing Janie with with Lauren and just, that just kind of worked it just was like perfect and it didn't really you know we obviously we're not asking people in the auditions <laughs> you would hear through agents or managers sometimes but it was definitely just trying to get the right kind of pairings of people. We did a lot of reads where people came in to read with each other, uh, you know, chemistry reads where, you know, people were reading with different actors and trying out different things. Um, and Alexis was really like the first piece in this puzzle. He got cast like in May, I think. And then after we got Alexis, then uh, then we just started, you know, kind of filling in the rest of the cast. And I know there's this kind of guiding principle for me and the casting director too, Stephanie Corsellini, did an incredible job. She's not here today, she's in LA. And SIG, yeah. And, um, but uh, we talked about this group of friends being like the island of misfit toys from that uh, Rudolph uh, special. <laughs> and how that they're all kind of like, all of them are kind of a little off and that's sort of what brought them together as friends in college. And so, you know, finding that kind of group, you know, it just took a little while. And, and you know, it felt very frustrating at the time, I remember, that it went so long, but, you know, in the end, we got such a great group of people together that I'm really glad that it took this long. You know, we had the time to kind of really do it right, so. Uh, yeah, I'm curious about the process. Uh, so when you cast everyone, did you have time to rehearse, or were you just thrown into it? Oh, well, that was actually, um, a big part of this friend thing too. Like I was really insistent that we have a full week of rehearsals before we started shooting for the actors to get to know each other. I thought, you know, everybody had to kind of act like they were friends. And I thought, well, if they're in a week of rehearsals, that's great. The problem is on an indie film, you have no money for anything. So they were the assistant director, I think, or the producer, somebody came to me and they were like, well, you, you can either have a week of rehearsal or lose like three shooting days. And I was like, well, we were doing the week of rehearsal and everyone was like shocked. Because they were like, that's gonna be impossible to shoot this movie in 22 days or whatever. But I was like, well, 
If they don't feel like a group of friends, I thought that rehearsal was... I don't remember that. I just remember us being best friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you spent a week with each other. <laughs> and in the, you know, in the rehearsal, I, we weren't ever working with everybody at the same time, so when we were working with like two actors, the other actors were off you know, smoking cigarettes as you did in the 90s. A lot of smoke. I love um, seeing Maddie Corman smoke so much in this movie. Oh my God, yeah. I remember <laughs> uh, I showed this film at a festival in DC and my parents came to see it then. And after the movie, my mom's first comment was like, there's a lot of drinking and smoking in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Which sort of annoyed me at first. Then I told a friend of mine, she's like, well, if that's your mom's like takeaway from this movie, like, a movie about two guys who want to get married, like, I think you're good, you know? Like, yeah, I think, I think things are fine. I have a question about uh, Tuck's character. He's so wonderful. Um, now, was the character always in a soap? Or, because at the time, Tuck was in a, a very popular soap opera. Um, and did that just sort of line up? Or did was that altered for the actor? Um, no, it was definitely written for a soap guy. We had... Again, every like soap actor in New York who was under 30 came in to read for this part. And when we were casting, you know, on the call or the whatever sheet that agents and managers get, it says like indie film. And I think a lot of the soap actors who came in to read thought indie meant serious, you know, like, oh, indie, it's like very 90s, dark, serious, you know. And people would come in to read and read the Sterling scenes very like high drama. And Tuck came in and, and we were laughing. He was the first time we laughed during a Sterling audition, I remember. And we were like, that guy was so funny. He like got it, that this was a comedy. <laughs> um, whereas a lot of other soap actors just didn't understand. They were just like playing this like so seriously. But, um, but yeah, that character was always a soap star. It actually, you know, thinking about this whole process again and talking about it, this movie was sort of started as two different ideas. One was about a group of college friends living together in like a group house. And the other idea was about a soap star who, whose agent wanted to, him to get married to a woman to kind of like cover up his, you know, blossoming gayness. <laughs> and both those ideas never really worked. And then about a year into the process with both of them, I just kind of smashed them together. <laughs> After going to a friend's wedding from college, I was like, oh, what if the soap guy came to this college friend's wedding is kind of like, you know, the, the thing, the catalyst that sort of sets everything off. Yeah. And that's sort of where where that came from. But There are many flips, uh, which I think are just so wonderful, uh, with um, the coming out story that uh, the gay person in the gay character in the film is the one who has the most trouble with someone coming out. And I just think it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly fresh now, um, and at the time, I'm, I'm curious about your inspirations. Uh, well, that's, I mean, that's sort of inspired by, you know, my college friend, group friends, um, friend of college, friends I went to college with. <laughs> my roommate in college, we were roommates for a year, and I had a roommate who was, who ended up being gay, but at the time he was straight, and I was like, oh, come on, you're gay. He's like, no, I'm straight. I'm like, okay, I guess, all right, whatever. <laughs> moving on, moving on. Um, and then a few years later, I found out, you know, that he was gay, and everyone was sort of like, oh, you didn't know that? I'm like, no. Like, he had told everybody else except me, and then I found out at a wedding, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about the restoration and the journey of the film um, going from, it was always Strand who was your distributor? Uh, Strand was the distributor the first time yeah. around, and then... I guess a couple of years ago when I knew it was getting close to the 25th anniversary, which was actually last April, but um, I just thought, you know, it'd be great to kind of get this back out into the world. It had fallen off of streaming, nobody has DVDs anymore, and there was just no way to see it. And um, <laughs> one DVD point. Oh, that's true, Julian really does have a DVD. Really um, I have a DVD of the movie. Yes, yes. And, uh, and so we were, I, you know, I was just kind of like, well, it'd be great to get this out there. And I started looking into it, and it was incredibly expensive. Like, yeah. doing these sort of 
transfers from the original negative into HD was really expensive. Um, but I met uh, Darren, St Darren Stein, who's a good friend of mine, he did Jawbreaker. Um, he had been transferring a couple of his films and he found a really cheap place to do it in LA that does like horror movies. <laughs> so, so they gave us a really good deal and Strand kind of got on board. They were, they were really like excited to kind of get this out there again. Um, and that's sort of where, how, how it started to happen. But um, it was really just kind of thinking and knowing that the anniversary is coming up and knowing that the movie wasn't around and, and people were always asking me about it. It definitely had um, some fans from when it was first out. Yeah, and hopefully there's a theatrical release, limited or otherwise, in its future, because it's just, again, it's amazing to experience it with the energy of a room of people. Yeah, like no, it's really fun seeing, seeing, it with, uh, seeing it with the audience. Yeah. How was your experience watching it again after 25 years? I thought it would be so skinny. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. I, 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 and cheesy. I loved every character in this movie the first time I read it. And I've seen it so many times. And um, a different actor sticks out to me. Um, and we are all still good friends, many of us. I was going to ask you that. Did, did you know each other before filming? I, I did. No. Of them. I don't think anybody knew me, anyone. Yeah. Before they did the movie, I mean, that's we realized people were fans of each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah people knew of each other, and. Um, and Christian, Christian was the last person we cast on the very last day of casting, actually. And that was kind of a funny story because um, Christian, we had real, we had a lot of trouble. That was the romantic lead in the movie, and there were so many agents and managers just turning us down left and right, like people just wouldn't consider this. And uh, and so then Christian was in the casting office as a messenger, bike messenger. And he knew somebody working in our production office, and they're like, hey, you should go in to audition for this movie. They haven't found one of their, their roles. And Christian walks into the casting room, and the casting director's like, Christian, what are you doing here? You passed on this three months ago. And he had never heard of the script. His wow. agent passed on it because it was a gay part. Wow. Yeah. Um, but then Christian, he was totally like dirty and sweaty. This was in August. As a bike messenger, he was like a wreck. He looked like a mess. And he's like, I have a few minutes to look at the script. We're like, yes, definitely. And then he came in and he read the scene and we were like, oh my God, like this, this is, is so perfect. I can't believe. Yeah, and it was really like the last day and, and, and he got a, man, a new manager and a new agent that we got. <laughs> no, there's something, you know, that lends, his performance lends to the, the whole uh, feel of the film. He, he, he definitely evokes a young Tony, Tony Curtis as we were talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I saw him too, Some Like It Hot is definitely one of my favorite kind of movies of all time and yeah, that was not lost on me. And was that, were, were films like that a direct uh, influence on the writing and directing of this film? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I was a big fan of, and I still am a big fan of like screwball comedies, more, you know, like the 30s, 40s era films, like fast talking and lots of drinking and smoking and, you know, the sort of uh, Ralph Bellamy type character who shows up at the uh, party and is kind of like the solid guy, yeah. but not really the right guy. and. And I remember during the shoot, I was constantly telling Alex, my number one direction to him was like, more Catherine Hepburn in this movie. We need more Catherine Hepburn here. Because, uh, yeah, I, I just love those movies and the style of them. And, 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 you know, sort of the idea for this, the bigger idea was trying to do an update on those stories. And, you know, back in that era, in the 30s, 40s, the, the shocking thing was like, you know, women being divorced and women kind of taking charge of their lives. And I thought, oh, well, here's, you kind of now can take this and plug in sort of what's happening with gay men. Sort of suddenly that's no longer, or starting to become less like of a shocking thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you know, the idea too of like two guys getting married was something that we wanted to present and this is just like, that's what's happening. Like the gay couple and the straight couple are sort of equal in a way. Um, and that was always a big part of this yeah. too, to kind of make them, the gay couple is better. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I was watching like the opening and I, and I, you know, when you haven't seen something in a while, you sort of forget why you did all these things. And I remember that scene with you guys in the bedroom and you're having your little romantic moment. And then it cuts to Bob and Brendan like wrestling on the floor. 
And then, you know, it's kind of like this, you know, one, one, here's what's happening in one room and then the other room, and it's kind of like same relationship, different expressions of it, you know, <laughs> like, and, and then the montages too, where you kind of are seeing all the couples kind of mixed in, the gay couples and the straight couples, and everybody's kind of going through their thing, but it's all love. It's not, you know, one is versus the other. It's like they're all characters struggling with, uh, relationships and, and being in love. Yeah, again, not to put too fine a point on it, but these film, a film speaking in that way was not being made at the time. I mean, it was yeah. really ahead of its, of its time. Yeah, I mean, uh, I remember, you know, it's funny, like, I remember too, The Birdcage came out right when we were starting to work on this movie, and everybody was like, oh, this is so great for your movie. Now you can make your movie. It's going to be great. Like, everybody wants the birdcage. And I'm like, yeah, Robin Williams is not in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> and also, like, the birdcage is great. I love it. It's really funny. But it's, you know, it's not really a romantic story in some ways. You know, it's like that is kind of pushed down a lot in that that's a studio film, and, and you know that at that time, that's what you could get away with. And you yeah. having Robin Williams and Nathan Lane sort of sells it yeah. to a broad audience. But I knew with this, you know, I just really wanted to do a more realistic kind of, you know, gays falling in love, straight people falling in love. It's all great, you know, kind of thing. And there was a lot of resistance to that when we were trying to get this made. Um, and I have to say. Uh, Somebody else who's here tonight that have played a huge role yeah. in this film getting made is Jordan Roth. Jordan, if you want to wave over there. With a, with a wonderful cameo. Yeah, Jordan. Jordan is our great cameo, saving Tuck from loneliness at the end of the movie. Loving the hospital scenes. Yeah, loving the hospital scenes. But um, we were really struggling to find ways to get this movie made, and uh, Lane, our producer, knew somebody who worked in Daryl Roth's office, and the script was there, but not hadn't been read. And then Jordan read it and was like, "You guys, this is really funny, and this is really good." And you know, that's how Daryl Roth got on board with this movie. And you know, it was really at that time it was just so hard to get this kind of a film out into the world and I, I can't tell you how much you know their involvement really you know got this thing started so thank you jordan and daryl daryl can be here tonight but thank you both thank you we're all very grateful for that um I, I would love to open it up to the audience uh if there are any questions for brian or jamie oh yeah just got to give us something about marty nixon oh marty nixon, marty nixon. yeah Marty was amazing. Uh, this was another thing, you know, we were trying to cast that part for months, and uh, like Elaine Stritch, my producer got on the phone with Elaine Stritch. She was her own agent and manager, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and he had this really intense conversation with her, and then he comes in the casting room, he's like, do you know someone named Elaine Stritch? <laughs> and I'm like, what? Like, he's like, yeah, we can't get her. She's just really difficult. And I'm like, oh my God, okay. So, <laughs> We were trying to get, you know, somebody really fun, somebody who had some, you know, kind of interesting history. And and then Marnie was through Stephanie, I think. It was Stephanie's idea who brought that in with Marnie. And she was like, do you know Marnie Nixon? I'm like, yeah, of course I know Marnie Nixon. She did the voices for all the great stars in the 50s and the musicals and was in Sound of Music. And she was like, well, Marnie would be game to do this, which was pretty great. Most of the older actresses we talked to did not want a movie where they did not have a trailer. And let's be honest. When you're, when you're at, and I get it, you know, like when you're at a certain age, you want a trailer. And we were like, yeah, there's no trailer on this movie. Everybody is just hanging out in a room in the basement smoking cigarettes. So Marnie was incredibly game and just so much fun to work with. And yeah, I just had such a great time. She was just so, you know, into this whole kind of wacky <laughs> idea of the movie. And everybody also, we were always trying to get her to sing on set. Everybody was trying to like get Marnie to like do it, and she wouldn't do it. And then months later, we were doing the looping for the movie where you go in and re-record dialogue. And she was re-recording some of the scenes where she's dancing with Kristen, Christian, one of the lines. And, um, 
And then she started telling a story about how she did a TV commercial and was in a booth in the 50s, and suddenly she started singing the jingle wow. from this 50s TV. And I heard the voice, and I was like, oh my god, I almost died. Like, I was like, that's amazing. So I was like, were we running tape on that? And they're like, no. Uh, like, damn. That's great. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, okay, sorry. Yeah. Oh, um, I just had a question, you know, uh, when you made the movie, obviously, a long time ago, and, and now time and perspective and views on relationship and romance, you know, as you get older, they kind of change. Looking at it now, would you have um, ended it differently or paired couples up differently, you know, thinking like, you know, this isn't how, you know, things really go or whatever? Well, I will say one thing, and this was sort of debated a little bit when we were writing and shooting the script was about the ending, about them, whether there should be like this big kiss kind of thing in the train station. And I, you know, they obviously like, you know, get together in the wedding night, but there was a lot of, you know, some people were like, yeah, they should have a really big kiss at the end, and I was kind of like, yeah, maybe, I don't know. But in the end, I felt, I liked the way that scene plays out with Christian just getting so emotional. You know, I felt like just would have, having a, a, the kiss would have sort of like, I don't know, ruin that really beautiful moment where he kind of realizes uh, the stuff. So, but now watching it, watching it again, I'm like, oh yeah, I guess that is kind of the really traditional way to end these sort of things. Um, <laughs> but I love the way you bookend it with the uh, with the two of them on the train because yeah, it's it sounds sterling, and then he leaves with. Maybe they could have made out on the train. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one thing, you know, because I think when you're when you're starting out as a filmmaker, you're like, I'm gonna do something that's really different, you know? And it's like, well, okay, but sometimes doing the same thing is pretty good too. Um, and I watch that now, I'm like, oh, that would have been like the very, you know, traditional rom-com. And I remember there was a lot of discussion about that back and forth. I have a question about the location. Hey, Brian. Um, Hi. The, the, um, you've shot that in Maryland's part? Is that right? The, the scene, the reception scene? Uh, no, it was all shot in New York and New Jersey, except for just uh, like a day and a half of exteriors in DC. DC, yeah, the DC shots were nice. How was the Union? You shot at Union Station, though. How was that? Oh, wow, that was like the uh, salt negotiations. <laughs> I mean, that was like, that was a process. Uh, we initially wanted to shoot traditional 30s rom-com on the track, on the platform, with the train. And, you know, I was talked out of that one pretty quickly by the producers. Um, and then it was all these, you know, when you're in Union Station, uh, the station has multiple people who own it and run it. Like there was a mall company, I think, that we got had approval from. But I do remember the one shot of Christian running from the cab into the station, we had to get approval from four different agencies. Wow. It was the National Park Service, the Capitol Police, the DC Police, and then the Union Station a train authority, whoever they were. So he crosses through like four, it's so DC, you know, like he crosses through like four jurisdictions going there. Um, but yeah, it, you know, the producers were always like the whole, so many arguments like, can't we just shoot this in New York? Like, why don't we just shoot this in New York? And I was always like, I don't know, it's just, there is sort of a point, like the Washington thing, setting the story there was meant to be like a little subversive political, you know, angle, and I really felt it was important to not fake it. Um, I mean, we faked it pretty well in the end, and we did get those two days that sort of give you the real DC stuff, but yeah, I really wanted it to be taking place in DC. I mean, one of my favorite subversive little scenes is with you in Tuck when you're on the steps of the Jefferson Memorial talking about gay marriage. Yeah, how did you get that? That was also a lot of negotiation, but the park service was pretty easy because that was just one group, but it did take a while. I mean, you know, when you have to get those permissions, it took a while. I will say both for that and for Union Station though, we did not have lockdowns, meaning we did not have control of the location, which is a whole different other thing. If you're a studio movie, then you have a lockdown. People are not crossing behind you. But in Union Station, we just kind of had a little corner. And we did the scene there, and everybody, the life was going on at Union Station. And we were just kind of making our little movie in the corner. And same thing with you guys. We kind of were off to the side of the memorial. 
and uh, the memorial was open, people were wandering around, and you're talking about gay marriage, as you do, you know, <laughs> at the Jefferson Memorial. Um, do you remember that? What's your memory of that scene? I remember somebody peed behind the Lincoln statue. <laughs> I don't think it was our crew. I think it was a regular person. That was it. Oh my God! I do remember that. Yeah. yeah. I didn't believe that somebody peed on Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> Jefferson. Yeah. Jefferson. Yeah. Jefferson. Yeah. I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And again, no lockdown, so people are peeing everywhere. Wow. Are you gonna do? Any other questions? Yeah, so you said that you made this movie kind of in response to kind of the state of um, LGBT cinema at the time. So do you have any thoughts about the state of LGBT, LGBT cinema today or like things you'd like to see change still? Or Well, I would say I would like to see more LGBTQ movies, really. Like there's so much on television now, which is amazing, like which is great. I, I really love going to the movies and I like to see, you know, movies. Um, <laughs> Uh, Stranger, sorry, the movie that just was out, Stranger, All the Strangers, All the Strangers. It was amazing to see that, you know, in a theater. And I just wish there, because there, there have been, obviously, like so many great LGBTQ movies since this movie was made, but I feel like now, the default for this material is, is television. Um, and I just would like to see, and you know, getting smaller, uh, gay movies made now is I would I would almost say it's even harder. I don't know you more direct experience recently, but I just know most of the stuff I've been trying to do is in television. Making features is really is is tough now. So it it seems like you have to really sort of do it in the independent space and yeah have as much autonomy as possible and you know hopefully someone's able to financially back you. But it is it is hard. Yeah, but you know like. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people talk about how the industry is in such a difficult place right now, and it's hard to get something made. And you know, I I don't know. My experience, it's never been easy to get anything made. <laughs> exactly. It's not like we had this script. I was like, oh yeah, let's make a movie. You know, that'd be great. It's like no, it's just you have a to different do. version of art. Yeah, it's a different version of art. It it just takes a while. Like the process of making these uh, films takes a long time, and um, and that's just sort of uh, the way it is. I mean, I think. Uh, with TV, it's a lot quicker of a yeah. process, for and, sure. And just circling back to your process, I, I understand the writing process for you is fairly, once you have the idea and the outline, the writing of it is fairly quick. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that from script to uh, to actual production? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I write pretty quickly. I don't like to sit in front of the computer. It makes me nervous, so I just try to get it over with, <laughs> like, really fast. And then, then, you know, I'll get people's feedback, and then I'll go back. And this script, the first full draft was, I think, in 1995, and then went through about 10 different drafts after that. And that was with a lot of, you know, feedback from a lot of, amazing people who really helped me shape this. It was my first feature, so I didn't really know what I was doing in terms of a feature. It takes a while to kind of figure out. It's kind of a different landscape than a short film. Yeah. Um, and the hardest thing for me to figure out was like the character. Short film is all about plot, generally. I mean, you know, a good short film is really very plot driven. Doing a really good feature is about really good characters that people fall in love with. And it took me a while to kind of, you know, get into that groove and, and figure out who all these people were as we were writing this and that you know just changed over time a lot and I I, I mean I was lucky because I had a lot of amazing feedback from friends of mine a lot of them are in the credits now Jonathan King was somebody um, who helped out a lot in this process and there were people working at Fine Line Cinema who were sort of, you know, maybe going to do this at one point, and they gave us a lot of good notes to make this a stronger film. So Mike Stremmel was somebody, too. He was at Fox Searchlight, and he gave me some incredible notes on the script that helped me kind of, you know, figure out what I was doing, because it, it did take a little while. It takes a village. Yeah, it does. It really does. Yeah, I mean, you know, you definitely... And then when you start to bring the actors in, you guys change the script a lot. And that, that was cool, like definitely for the better. Like, and that's also why I wanted a week of rehearsal because I just know the minute you get actors with your script, things are going to change, and that's great. Like, I love when that happens because there's so many things. I didn't change anything. 
I said every word. Oh no, you, you, you had some you had some good ad libs, I think, too. There's a lot of like Maddie did. Maddie definitely has like some of the best ones. Um, I love when she's <laughs> Going into trash she's like lesbians, let's away. Shakespearean. <laughs> I think they had all been drinking. Haven't you all been drinking that night? Probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that happens sometimes uh, as they were waiting. But great. yeah, the actors' feedback was was great on this movie. Just working with everybody. Everybody brought so much to their parts. Truly. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, well, I'll ask one. Don't get nervous. I'll ask one. Uh, the music is really incredible and evocative, um, and seemed like expensive. Uh, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so was that uh, a huge? Um, was that a battle? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It took a long time to get the rights for those songs. I feel like that process was probably like two or three years almost. Wow. And, and originally, you know, the idea, this was like a theme happening in a lot of indie movies at that time. Like you would find like the, uh, your musical group um, and you know, you plug in a lot of like vintage songs from the 60s or 70s and that was sort of like a thing a little bit. And the original, you know, title of this film was I Think I Love You Actually. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, was part of the whole Partridge thing. But when we were negotiating for the song rights, they said, well, if you want to call it I Think I Love You, that's like an extra $50,000 <laughs> to use the title. And, then, and I was like, well, what if we, oh, they said you can use the title, but then, and you don't have to pay us, but you can't use any of the songs then. So it's sort of like, you know, it's like an upcharge. Because <laughs> that song was baked into the film already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Partridge Family stuff was definitely something I you know kind of grew up on. I was nostalgic about and really really loved. And, it uh, plays so well when it's coming through the wall and that scene when they're wrestling and it just you just hear it sort of diegetically. Yeah, yeah. Confused. Brian, didn't part. David didn't David Cassidy's manager talk to you at one point about possibly having David re-record "I Think I Love You" for the movie? Uh, I think we were trying to do something like that. Then of course we had no money to really do that, but it was a nice idea. Like there was, there was definitely, you know, it was a, we were going through very, a lot of different uh, avenues to the Partridge family. And that music, of course, was written by somebody who had no, nothing to do with the Partridge family. The songwriter of a couple of songs was actually gay, which was to our advantage in the end, because um, he had to sign off on those. And, uh, and it was just a matter of persistence. I feel like music rights, they just say no until they finally say yes. That's sort of how it works. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I guess it's the same with everything. Well, but, not, um, not everything. <laughs> but yeah, we ended up getting a pretty good deal. Like, we had, we had limited uses. We couldn't use the songs in the trailer. We couldn't use the song in TV commercials. Not that we were going to be running spots on Friends or anything. But yeah, they were like, oh, you can't use it in TV commercials. I'm like, okay. Like, that would be great if we could afford a TV commercial. <laughs> Forget the music. Like, let's have a TV commercial. But, um, but yeah, it just took a long time, and and you know, it's just uh, it's persistence, like like making the film, like you said, it's a lot of no's for everything until you get the yes. Well, I'm so happy that you got the yeses that you did, and you brought this wonderful thing to life. <laughs>